As low as you can go, Lady Danbury? With these knees? Yes, Your Majesty. Very well. Welcome to Miss Mojo, and today we'll be answering the question, who was the real Queen Charlotte? Are you requiring your queen to ask again? Or tell me what you know. For this list, we'll be diving into the life of the historical figure who inspired Bridgerton's reigning monarch before Netflix takes us back to the character's origins in the spin-off Queen Charlotte, A Bridgerton Story. Do you know of any Lady Whistledown-worthy tidbits we missed about the queen? Let us know in the comments. Young Charlotte The future Queen Charlotte of Great Britain and Ireland, Electress of Hanover, was born May 19, 1744, as Sophie Charlotte of Mecklenburg Strelitz. Her family ruled a small duchy in northern Germany. She received an unremarkable education for a young noblewoman, and had no experience with any kind of court life until her brother assumed the dukedom in 1752. Her father was quite strict in his upbringing of his daughters, Charlotte, along with her sisters, were kept in quiet seclusion, away from the adult dinner parties of the day. At the age of 17, she was, by all accounts, a sweet girl, disinterested in political ambition. This made her very attractive to the 22-year-old George III, who had recently come into his own throne. She was laid upon a couch. The ambassador then placed his foot upon her and claimed her for George. She was then returned to the nursery while the adults discussed the role and business in finer detail. Negotiations moved swiftly, and the pair married by proxy in August of 1761. Charlotte set out for her new home, braving a particularly rough sea journey to join George in England. The voyage took two weeks. You are expected to step up to the plate and become a British queen, just like that. A royal love begins. It was a moment straight out of a rom-com. The nervous young Charlotte allegedly got out of her carriage and stumbled on her way to present herself to her new husband. He caught her. Hello, Charlotte. I'm George. Adorable, right? The pair were officially married later that day, September 8th, 1761, starting a devoted partnership that would last throughout the rest of their lives. The couple then entertained at St. James's Palace, singing and dancing, and chatting to a new husband, until the early hours of the morning. Early in their marriage, they bonded by playing music together, and George helped Charlotte study to improve her limited English. It set a pattern for their long relationship to come. Over their years together, they were endlessly loving and supportive of each other. Notably, George III is one of the few Hanoverian monarchs who was never known to have any mistresses. All that I have witnessed, ma'am, is the love a king shares with his queen and nothing more. Family life. While St. James's Palace was the official royal residence, the young king and queen made their home in the nearby Buckingham House. Oh, and got busy! Their eldest son, also named George, was born less than a year after their marriage. He would be followed by 14, yes, 14 siblings, 12 of whom survived childhood. It was a fantastic collection and for the first time in centuries, England had more heirs than titles to give each one. Charlotte was an especially devoted mother, though the circumstances of later life would bring out a controlling streak that her children didn't generally appreciate. However, none of them have yet appeared on screen in Bridgerton. Perhaps that explains why Charlotte is so involved with the love lives of her subjects instead. Miss Edwina, have I yet told you about my nephew? He is a prince and he is available. Charlotte's Court. The royal marriage faced some early hurdles, namely interference from George's mother, Princess Augusta, which is hinted at in the teaser for Queen Charlotte. Your marriage is the business of this country. This cannot go wrong. For the most part though, the couple seemed to enjoy a very happy life together. Both were passionate devotees of music and hosted weekly concerts. Bridgerton mentions accurately how Mozart performed at one such event as a child. The boy accompanied me as I sang an aria, and I declared then and there that he should become one of the finest composers in Europe. And certainly you were right. Well, I'm really wrong about such matters. He would eventually dedicate his Opus 3 to Charlotte. The royal couple's court included artists and intellectuals as well as nobles, and Charlotte treated her inner circle like close friends 
rather than subjects. The Queen was also interested in botany and helped cultivate Kew Gardens. They are in full bloom. After your meal, perhaps we could take a walk like we used to do. And yes, as seen in Bridgerton, she did enjoy her snuff, keeping an entire room at Windsor for her supply. An ingenious idea, ma'am. Yes, that is why I thought of it. The author thinks she has bested us all with her illicit spying and reporting. Well, no one has sharper eyes on the tom than I do. <laughs> the Madness of King George George III reportedly had his first mental health episode in 1761, and Charlotte was kept unaware. However, when he had another in 1788, there was no hiding the truth from her. Do you think that you are mad? I don't know. George's affliction, now thought to be porphyria, caused mania, paranoid delusions, and violent outbursts. When he was unwell, a despondent Charlotte would lock herself and the children away from him and pace endlessly with worry. George suffered these spells on and off until 1810, when the death of his favourite child, Amelia, sent him into a permanent decline. What did you... Uh, uh, have you done something? What have you done? What has this woman done to my child? Majesty. No, what have you done? What have you done? Though his experience was terrible, Charlotte suffered nearly as much. She battled her own depression as a result and became prone to dramatic mood swings. Unfortunately, her children were often the targets of her temper, which, combined with her growing compulsion to control them, strained those relationships. In Bridgerton, we see a few painful encounters between Charlotte and the infirmed George, but this is all fiction. What are they... Uh... No, no, I'm happy. What are they doing? Stop! Leave! Leave me! Leave me! Flotty. Both out of fear for her safety and heartbreak, Charlotte was never with her husband again after he slipped into permanent madness, though she remained his stalwart guardian to the end of her life. You're a good little woman, Mrs. King. And we have been happy, have we? Oh, yes, <laughs> Mr. King. And Charlotte. The Regency. Though Bridgerton begins in 1813, two years into the Regency period, the Regent is conspicuously absent. Or at least the historical Regent is. Or she simply left for the country as the rest of us did in the off-season, bored by the lack of any real gossip. In the show, Queen Charlotte seems to be the sole and undisputed ruler of both the social scene and the United Kingdom. In reality, Charlotte was happiest at home and notably almost totally apolitical. Good evening, Mrs. King. Good evening, Mr. King. When we get this far, I call it dandy. Huh? Upon their marriage, George had instructed his wife not to meddle in government, and she was always happy to comply. The Queen did oppose the appointment of her son, the future George IV, as regent, but it was the strongest public stance she ever took. Under his eventual leadership, she would continue acting as the hostess and first lady of the British court, since George's relationship with his own wife could make reality TV look tame. Uh, the prince gave me to understand that he was endeavouring to please you most especially by marrying. By marrying, yes, but not Caroline of Brunswick. Now there, my dear Lady Jersey, is a woman I cannot recommend at all. Charlotte on screen. Until recently, Charlotte's depictions on screen were few and far between. People will notice you are missing, will they not? I shall worry about that later. Her first noteworthy appearance was in the 1979 miniseries Prince Regent, portrayed by Frances White. It would take another 15 years before she would pop up again, this time in 1994's The Madness of King George. You abandoned me to my tormentors. The doctor said it was for your own good. What do they know of my good? Starring Helen Mirren as Charlotte, the movie sees her contend with George's 1788 health episode and the resulting Regency crisis. Charlotte would grace our screens again when Golda Rochevel brought her to life in Bridgerton. While you may be content to accept defeat, it is certainly not how I approach things. The character is not very accurate to what we know of the historical figure, but Rochefell's regal portrayal has made her a fan favourite. 
so popular in fact that the character received her own spin-off prequel in 2023. I'm curious, what are you doing? Nothing. You're doing something. I am not. You are. I am not. You are. The Royal Bloodlines. With the casting of Golda Rochevel came a renewed interest in the question of Queen Charlotte's race. Shonda Rhimes puts a black actress as Queen Charlotte and now it has everybody talking about history. With a woman of colour in the role, an intriguing theory started to gain new attention from curious viewers. Some historians contend that the historical figure might have had some mixed ancestry, courtesy of her distant ancestor, Alfonso III of Portugal. Up until the 1100s, there was an Arab and African occupation of Portugal. This is where King Alfonso found his wife, who was a Moor. In those times, the word was used to describe people of Arab or African descent. Certainly, there is a famous portrait of Charlotte in which her features appear racially ambiguous. However, she was several centuries removed from King Alfonso, and there's a lack of any hard evidence to support the idea. We can never definitively say it isn't true, but it would be a long shot. It still makes for an interesting game of what if, though. We have certainly been devoting our energies to the endeavor, Your Majesty. We should hope to see our Queen soon satisfied. See to it that you do. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Legacy At the time of her death in 1818, Charlotte had been Queen Consort for 57 years and 70 days, the longest tenure of any royal consort in British history to that point. The record wouldn't be broken until Prince Philip surpassed it in 2009. Her name lives on in the many places and institutions that were titled in tribute to her. Do you know why? Because when I choose to extend to someone my favour, I expect them to make good on it. She's also credited with bringing the Christmas tree tradition to Britain when she put one up at the Queen's Lodge Windsor, inspiring a wave of imitators and changing the holidays forever. Kevin, what is it with you and Christmas trees? How could you have Christmas without a Christmas tree, Mom? Meanwhile, the debutante ball that she founded in 1780 continued well into the 20th century seeing thousands of nervous young women presented to their monarch over the years. I've seen enough. But your majesty, there's still- I have seen enough! Though it was eventually discontinued in 1978, it made a 21st century comeback, now with a emphasis on networking and the development of professional skills for young women. Charlotte was famously a traditionalist, but we think a modern day Eloise type could persuade her to evolve on her idea of what makes a diamond. I'm more of an emerald person myself. <clears throat> My favorite necklace is one of emeralds. How thoughtful of you to know that. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.